For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lynn Lewis. I'm the gallery coordinator here at FSCJ, and I'd just like to welcome you to our discussion of Pickin', a conversation about black girlhood, art, and fire-breathing dragons. Our presenters today are going to be Erin Kendrick, whose wonderful paintings and sculptures are here in the South Gallery through April 9th, and Shawana Brooks, literary artist, curator, and self-styled musence which for one, I hope you can speak to that because I, I find that a wonderful term. Uh, before we begin the discussion, I'd just like to introduce you also to Professor Melissa Boyd, um, who is the chair of the annual FSCJ Artist Series. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, that's a yearly program that we, we put on here at the college. And this exhibit is loosely related to that, that, that project. She's gonna give you a little bit of information about about the author series and also one of the student projects that we have on the, in the gallery here as well. So Missy, if you'd like to go ahead. Sure. Hi, welcome. I'm so to be able to tell you a little bit about the author series and, and about the student connection and artwork that's here in the gallery this year. So the book that we chose this year is called Michaela de Prince's Taking Flight. And it's a story about a young girl who was adopted out of Sierra Leone her parents, had, she was orphaned. She was adopted by two people in the United States. And in doing so, she was able to achieve a dream, but she had a lot to overcome to achieve that dream. And she really gives us a lot of inspiration and insight into the world of ballet, which was what her goal was, is to become a, a first-class ballerina. And she succeeded and she's still very young. She's only in her young twenties. But I think the fact that she could set her mind Goal and accomplish it really speaks a lot to her inner strength. So um, Patrick Nico's class, his draw, um, his um, printmaking class one and two, had did a display here for us in relation to it. I'm walking around, so I'm going to try to show you in the background some of the pieces of the puzzle that he created. And you can see of some of the student artwork that was done. Professor Miko um, was able to have the students design these, these images based upon the book and the themes in the book. And then he also then put the print onto a large, put the pieces of the puzzle together and put the print, ah, all together, I'm sorry, to do with the phone than I thought. And you can see this here. So I'm very grateful for their, their effort in this artwork students did in response and I'm thankful that they got to be a part of it to feel like that art was how it connected to the to the writing to the discussions and all that we had they were a huge success and, and I'm very grateful for all their participation so I thank you and I will turn it back over to the rest of the show okay so um, a few more thank yous I of course I'd like to thank you Melissa and also and Patrick Maiko as well as Professor Michael Cottrell who um, got to test run his new toy uh, with the art department has a new laser cutter um, who, and so he was able to help Aaron with the installation. So I really thank him for that. Um, also, uh, I'll be leaving links to Aaron's website and also a, um, the gallery webpage with much of her work and a 360 video uh, of the space. So you can kind of take a virtual tour if you can't come and visit us before April 9th. So um, just to give you a brief introduction of our guests, Erin um, Kendrick is an international artist and arts educator whose color-rich acrylic ink-stained works of art and transformative installations seek to inspire a dialogue about contemporary spectatorship and the power of language as it relates to the lived experiences of Black women and girls. She has exhibited throughout the United States and abroad and maintains a studio at Cork's Art, Art District. Erin earned her an MFA from Georgia State University and a BFA from Florida State University. She is currently the Director of Education and Lead Visual Art Instructor at Jacksonville Arts and Music School. She was the Cultural Council of Jacksonville's Great, uh, sorry, of Greater Jacksonville's 2019 Art Educator of the Year and was similarly recognized by Folio Weekly. Um, in 2021. Her first author chapter will be published by Liverpool University Presses in the book With Fist Rays, Radical Art, Contemporary Activism, and the Iconoclasm of the Black Arts Movement. Sorry, movement. Now, Shawana Brooks is a poet, storyteller, curator, and art, artist advocate living in Jacksonville, Florida, who used her art to evolve storytelling fused to issues of community. 
As an arts advocate, her work revolves around prioritizing artists and making sure they are what they are, they have what they need to be creators of culture for our city. Formerly the arts and culture developer for the Jack's Makerspace at the main public library, Brooks' new ventures include the socially distanced art space, six foot away gallery, the Color Jack's Blue Initiative, working uh, work with the national campaign to, to come to your census. And she continues to host a podcast, Shawana Salon, and is the 2021 recipient of the Innovator Award for the Jacksonville Image Awards. I'm pretty sure I barely scratched the surface of what Shawana has been up to in the last uh, couple of years, but um, but just let it be known that these are both uh, two powerhouses, and I'm 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 really glad to have them here to talk today. Thank you. I guess we will go ahead and jump in there. Um, but thank you so much, Lynn. That is a, a wonderful introduction. Um, so pleased to be in your company and to have this opportunity to talk to Ms. Kendrick uh, about her newest series of work. So, um, you know, we're going to do our best to get right in it. Um, thank you guys for, you know, coming in, participating. We're going to hear a couple of beeps as people come in and out, but we're going to focus in with that. We're just also going to remind you that as you do come in, please make sure that you mute yourself and that you also turn off your video. Unless you want to be included in the conversation, I know a good deal of you, and I will start asking you questions if you stay on uh, as panelists to the conversation as well. But um, so excited now to get ready to talk to Aaron. So again, just make sure. Oh, OK. So I know, Lynn, you also spoke to the fact that we're going to have um, an interpreter on to be doing things and talking as we're going along. So I'm really excited to have um, that accessibility um, and also to do my best not to get distracted because I love sign language and have been wanting to learn <laughs> how to do it more myself. So let's also thank Elizabeth for her time and being here. Um, thank you so much for providing that kind of opportunity for the students to be able to be engaged in the conversation. Um, also just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this is not just me talking to Aaron. It's all of you talking to Aaron too. So uh, please make sure that if, as you have questions that you put them in the chat so we can refer to them as we get closer to the end. I know how it is when you're so excited and, and then you forget what it was that you wanted to refer to. So go ahead and just put that question in there. And when it's time to have a response, we'll try to pull you all into the conversation as well so you can ask these questions directly to Aaron. So Aaron, um, you're sitting there mm -hmm. in the South Gallery, uh, the Nathan H. Wilson Center for the Arts there at FSEJ. Um, mm -hmm. so we want to talk and, of course, get into your work um, that Lynn, you know, um, said earlier. The title is Picking, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about what that means. But um, it's been a year, right? We're we're here. Right. It's <laughs> March. It's 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 a, a weird timeline. It was. Only just last year in March, um, we were at uh, my exhibition that was at Yellow House, Magic, Mirth, and Mortality. Um, mm -hmm. And you were talking about how you were wanting to get into a new series, but you were feeling a, a little bit defunct. I think I can share that, um, Aaron and I mm -hmm. are particularly <laughs> close, where what we like to call artners, so we work a lot. So I get to hear, uh, of course, a lot of the process that even goes on before she gets to uh, a piece of work. But um, the pandemic was a challenge. It still is a challenge. We're not out of it. You know, people keep talking um, as if like we're we're towards the end. But the pandemic has been a, a challenge on a lot of creatives and how they're moving through. So, how did you navigate this time? And what did you focus on that kind of helped you to move forward? Um, I think for me, um, at the time that you were uh, like addressing, like the time when you were having your exhibition, I was thinking about this new body of work about black girls. Um, I think what happened during the pandemic really kind of honed that in for me. Um, cause you know, pandemic happens. We're all stuck in our homes. I was fortunate enough to be perfectly safe and sound. I was fortunate enough to, you know, keep at least one job. So a lot of my attention went to my students during that time and really trying to help them kind of unpack and understand everything that was going on. So I think even being um, sort of like student minded at that time really honed in for me, like the need to get this body of work out. 
Um, you know, in the past, I've always worked on my work has been more about black women. And it's really kind of a step backwards to sort of see how how these women get to the place that they are, you know, how these women sort of come to be. And of course, it was a national thing too, like, you know, the the larger conversation, not just the conversations that we've always had in private or in our homes or in our communities or in hair salons, you know, those conversations about black girlhood and, and adultification and all those things were starting to happen, happen in a more public form. So it just felt timely. Um, I created one painting over the pandemic. Um, that was the connector painting. Um, another thing in that time that really got to me was the, the black and missing black and missing girls, like little black girls kept going missing, you know, whether it was the situation here in Jacksonville, where, you know, in the, in the neighborhood where I teach, everybody's out looking for a missing little girl to so like the little girl in Alabama who was stolen out of her, out of her yard. So all those things really got me to this point. Um, and speaking about like, you know, missing girls and all those things really also, as you said before, hit close to home. There were several missing girls um, in our own community that got more national attention and kind of hurt. So, and thinking about, you know, these missing girls and the work that you already do with um, kind of, you know, mentoring, but educating young black girls on, on a consistent and everyday basis, you, that I think a lot affects your process and how you look at um, your bigger, you know, kind of con context around your work, right? Where we talked before how you've, for the most part, done portraiture um, and you've shown black women, young black women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't want to say they black ain't cracking, so we don't know how how <laughs> age of, of the women. In your right. Practice, right? But, but, they're, but they're grown women that you've kind of um, mm -hmm. identified and, and saw as um, as a way of communicating your your visual literacy, and so how long had it been since you created um, a, a a body of work? Um, actually, um, one of the other people who's on now and listening to the presentation at right at the start of COVID, I had an opening that week um, that was in tandem with Bobby O'Connor, who's, you know, one of the people listening in, we had a, uh, a collaborative show that was gonna open up at Hendrix um, Avenue Baptist Church. So that was the last time I created a body of work. And of course, like I said, the show would have opened the week. So with myself and Bobby and Hope. <laughs> um, and then from that point, I was really just, creating sort of like independent singular pieces, like no real body of work until I did that first like connector painting um, about the little girl who went missing, Taylor Williams. And from there, I started to just kind of put the pieces together for this body of work that I have now and really just kind of slowly but surely um, started to build these stories for these, um, we, we talked about words yesterday and we were thinking characters, but now we're thinking archetypes, you know, thinking about stories for these um, little girls and kind of building where, where they will start and where they will end up and then just jumped into the work from there. So this is my first full body of work since, since the pandemic happened. Um, and oh, what images they are. Um, I have not had my chance yet to come to the gallery to see them, but I have, um, been able to see your work because you were so gracious enough to to give us um, a, a virtual exhibition of it, as you can see. And so I, I want to get in a little bit more to to who these young women are. Um, and even saying young women, right? That's kind of inappropriate. Like really right. <laughs> calling them mm -hmm. girls, these children. Um, and I want to speak more to that now. So, you know, what's in the name? Um, a lot of your process, of course, is um, interpreting words and getting connected. To, to literary things, and I want to go into that as well, but um, the show name, Pickin', mm -hmm. tell us about that. Can you elaborate on it? Yeah, when I got ready to um, put this show together, I really had the option for this particular space to create just kind of like an independent solo show or to um, partner, collaborate with like the author series that they have here. And of course, the book that they were reading is the Michaela DePrince book, Taking Flight. And I chose to use that also because, like, as you say, I do tend to use lit lit or refer to literary works um, 
in my body to work. And that's really just about the reteaching of things that either people never read the first time or didn't get the first time. So I'm, you know, the teacher in me is always trying to reteach through my work. And in reading the book, um, which is about, uh, she starts the book out, of course, um, in her childhood in Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. And they always refer to her as Pickin. And, you know, my understanding of Pickin, my like American version of Pickin has always been in reference to like Pickaninny. And, you know, the derogatory word from like slavery times, you know, just describing like what would essentially be like a black, you know, the big lips kid um, that you see in a lot of like Americana and things like that. And I didn't understand it to, to, have, to have derived from an actual word that really just meant in like African, um, in like Africa and some like Caribbean um, <clears throat> places as just a child. It's just a child, not even like a black child, it's just a child. So that really appealed to me. Like language is a large part of my work. Um, how we use words, how words have been used. I always say when describing my work, like I think black women historically are victims of language. Like we have historically kind of been what people said we were. Um, and a lot of my work is about unpacking that and walking backwards from that and kind of figuring out and walking through like our, our authentic selves. So just the title of the show itself is just a reference to that, like how I like to deal with language, how I like to, you know, think through like all the different meanings of a word and how we interpret that. So here you are, you know, just breaking down language, right? Getting getting really into it. And then the narratives, right? And so much of, I think, you know, even my child, I can re recall very vividly when somebody said, pick it any. You know, right. um, and, and, and what that visually communicated to me, normally a very unkept looking child, you know, someone mm -hmm. in their hair, you know, kind of tattered in rags and twisted up a bit. And I don't know, for some reason, maybe a, a girl kind of always edified that visual to me, right. too, you know, yeah. so, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and so much in your work, again, is uh, is is getting down more to the contextual reasons of these images and helping us to become aware of, of, of what we've done and how we've seen ourselves, especially how we've seen black women in our society. So I wanna read um, just a little bit of your artist statement. Um, so people who haven't got a chance to, to see it or get online, um, just that first kind of paragraph that I think really puts into perspective why you wanna get into this subject matter. Um, so. And while you do, while you start to read, I'm going to go ahead and have Lynn, if you want to go ahead and start showing some of the images, we could show some of the images from the show. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Lynn. So um, bear with me, guys, as I, as I read this, these, these, this sweet narrative to you. <laughs> um, so Anna starts off saying, you know, um, in spite of the relentless adultification of young Black girls, they are children first. I want to repeat that um, they are children first to experience adolescence authentically without the intrusion of racial bias and spiritual, emotional and physical violence is their absolute right. However, the idea that black girls are small black women is highlighted in various capacities in the United States. Disproportionate discipline rates for black girls in schools, for subjective infractions, expectations of keeping family secrets in spite of sexual, emotional, and physical trauma, resistance to non-traditional gender identities, and a lack of empathy in cases of black missing and endangered, and endangered girls, incessant, unwarranted police violence, as well as the age-old myth of the black Superwoman. You know, um, I was really taking some time with your artist statement and with your and, and with your words. Um, and so many images started to flood my mind over the past few years, especially when you see how black young girls are are are, are talked about in the national news, right? So we have um issues with young women being over policed, of course, because of their hair. Um, the images of the corrections, you know, of the officer who's on school property, who's basically got like his his knee in this young girl's face, 
right? Um, thinking even back to the the young girl when the pool party, you know, um, right. and how the police officer treated her. And yes, this again over sexualization, but this over adultification. I think the adultification mm -hmm. is what really becomes um so apparent. And what I love about that is you make that connection to remind us that we keep looking at these 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 little figures and placing womanhood on them, right? Mm -hmm. And with everything mm -hmm. that, that comes and challenges, even for grown black women to enter in. So, you know, Aaron, why why does this subject matter? Like your your work again centering on black women, and this is such an extent extension, I think, of that work, but it's also a distinction from your previous works. Yeah, um, I really think um it's something that one being so connected to kids, you know, even just in my professional career, you know, the advice has always been to focus on my artwork, you know, like be an artist 100% of the time. And I cannot do that. Like I cannot not teach. Um, age doesn't really matter in that capacity, um, but I cannot not teach. I cannot be connected to these kids and I don't have kids of my own. So it's kind of like, <laughs> they're my proxy uh, when it comes to having kids. and it's like this, the more you read about adultification, the more you understand how connected we are to our like child selves, you know, how, um, how so much of our adult lives are hinged upon like our, our, our lives as children. So why disconnect the two, you know, why it was kind of like a natural pro progression for me. And then just the whole notion of adultification, like I was even having a conversation with a mom this morning who, who had seen she saw the show this morning and she said you know as a mother it made me rethink some things you know so when we talk a little bit more about the individual paintings she was like it's some of the things that we've been taught like generationally and we just don't think about you know how we are sort of pushing these like adult values and these sort of like um just the over sexualization and stuff how early we push that on to kids in the name of protection you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the name of protection. And so I really just wanted to kind of bind the two stories together. You know, I spoke with someone recently who was speaking about, um, this was someone from the Weaver, Dolores Weaver Policy Center. Um, and she was speaking about how she had spoken to someone who had an issue with the juvenile justice system when she was like under 12. And at, and at like 29, 30, 31 was still having to answer for that you know, mm. in her adult life. So it's like, it's like both of them. Right, um, and, and, and then you even talked about this, this challenge of what the adultification does when it comes to more determinants of punishment, right? Um, and even mm -hmm. how, I thought it was interesting when you mentioned the mother um, and how sometimes even we communicate that own consistent punishment against girls for their own protection, right? Right. Um, so, and then speaking of the protection, I also love, um, and, and such the rich imagery, and then probably, again, we'll ask Lynn to, to share those images just in a second. Um, I wanna connect to the way that you do see your work um, and, and storytelling and, and these mm -hmm. stories that you've made um, for these brilliant black youth. So, so tell us, can you tell us a little bit um, let's talk about Little Dragon. Who is she? Okay. What um, does she look like? Okay, so um, I'll kind of start talking about it and Lynn can bring up some of the images. But like the main image that you've seen for the show is a is a character um, called Little Dragon. So all of these little girls are personas. They're, they're not, so I'm not painting, although I'm painting little girls that I know. I am not painting them as themselves. So these are all like characters in a larger body of work and a larger story. And Little Dragon is, of course, um, she's sort of like the main image and sort of like the main point of conversation when we're talking about adultification. A lot of times we talk about like what happens in the school system. So she's my school girl. Um, and we spoke earlier about the book, uh, Taking Flight, the McKillar the Prince book. There's one particular line in the book. I'm going to read it off the wall. It says, um, and well, let me preface it. She was, of course, put into an orphanage um, with some with other black children in Africa, 
And the orphanage, like the caretakers for the orphanage were not very nice. They were not very loving. And her and her best friend who, you know, they became best friends in the orphanage were being punished for something that they really hadn't done. Mm. Um, and these, and they were young. These are, we're talking like three to four years old, little three, three to five years old. So there's one line in the book that says, um, I wish that I were a dragon and could shoot out my anger in a breath of fire. And that line was just, it just resonated so much with me because I know so often we have these conversations of like how we have to restrain ourselves in the name of survival. I think even like with uh, with what's going on in the news today, like when you see like what happened on, what's the show? The chat, the view, the I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> With Cheryl Underwood and um, and Sharon Osborne, like yeah. I think a lot of a lot of us who are like brown girls, black and brown girls on this, we know who Cheryl Underwood is. Like old right. Cheryl Underwood. Like don't play Cheryl Underwood. So to see the type of restraint that she had to display on yeah. national TV to me is remarkable. And I know a lot of people don't know old Cheryl Underwood. Right. So right. it's just, it's that thing. So just like in our conversation before about how connected we are to our childhood itself, like just in the name of survival, how much restraint we have to show. So this particular image, um, she's my schoolgirl in this storyline and she's raising, you know, she has her finger up. So, you know, as a viewer, you know, is she raising her hand? Is she showing attitude? Cause so often little girls are assumed to be, um, assumed to have attitudes like, Data-wise, um, black girls in school get written up more, get um, you know apprehended more by school police, get suspended more, um, and a lot of that is based off of what's called subjective infractions. So mm -hmm. these are things that may not even necessarily be in the rule books for the school, but the teacher has decided, you know, with their own, you know, from their own opinion, that this child has done something wrong. So we, they just get punished a lot more. So what I wanted to do with this character was really, um, I in, on her school uniform, I made her school mascot, the little dragon. So you see the little dragon on her school uniform and you can kind of see like the fire up under her, like a fire under her wanting to like come out, but she knows that it can. The, the imagery of a little dragon, um, also her stance, right? Um, you mm -hmm. said that, that finger up, um, her looking, directly at us, you know, as us being the viewer of seeing her, but her daring us to look back. Um, and, and in the way that you just said before, um, how our young black girls are, and especially again, through media, through a lot of even um, historical um, references, when you think about shows like um, What's Happening, um, there's always the, the, the sassy, you know, sidekick little sister. There, there was that variance of that black girl for so long. Yes, she's smarter than everybody else, right? But because she's right. smarter than everybody else, she also has to be taken down a notch about how she gives them that information. And and seeing this new kind of contextualized image of that, we already said like the fire that's coming underneath her um, and the belief of young black girls, there is right. also holds very true within the educational system and just again society of general like something happens and and you don't believe the young black girl who was there at the incident or you know whatever it's always as if they're doing something else again the adultification of looking mm -hmm. at that that young woman so um we appreciate you know what you were able to convey and again really looking and and looking at her um, and so you also chose these these really beautiful backgrounds, um, very rich in color against the color contrast of your subject matters. Um, can we can we take a look at Tay? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that'll be the blue background one. Cool. And then um yeah, Tay is my my cautionary tale, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And so, so let's this is the one at... go ahead. About Tay, let's talk a little bit about her. I mean, one, um, the imagery of, of of her, her face, her tilt, uh, but these safety cones. I, I was struck with um, my own kind of want of protecting her, or this kind of protection of her, and and these safety cones. Um, and, and like maybe what is she doing? And also for her not to be hurt, right? I instantly wanted to protect her in a different way that I didn't feel the need to protect 
little dragon. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about her, about Tay? Yes. Um, one thing that actually happens in this um, image that does come up in my uh, paintings of adult women is this sort of like stare. Um, in this image, she is not. Usually in my paintings, the, the women stare directly back at the viewer. In this one, she is not staring at the viewer. Like you can see in this image that she, she sees or hears something else. Like something has caught her attention. Um, the name Tay is it references two different things. One, um, the Breonna Taylor story, and I know everybody on here by now knows what happened to Breonna Taylor and her being killed by the police in her home. And it also references, which as you can tell by now, really kind of got to me because it was in my neighborhood and so close to like where the kids I teach go to school, um, the, when Taylor Williams went missing. And if someone's on here who doesn't, Jacksonville, um, I can't remember her age, Had somewhere between like four and six, um, who went missing locally. The whole city went looking for her, of course, for days. Everybody's looking for her. End of the story, her mom was the one, alleged, allegedly, I guess. Her mom was the one who committed the crime, but they found her body in a different state. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's that's her story. So, so Tay is my cautionary tale. Um, in terms of imagery, uh, the headphones that she's wearing, this was actually, of all the paintings that I have here, and we will continue to make in this body of work, I've taken all of the photos, except for this one. This was a, from a photo of a friend of mine who um, lives in South Florida. I actually saw this photo a while ago, like probably years ago, and it really just stuck with me. So when, uh, when I was putting together this body of work, I came back to this and I asked permission to use this photo, of course, you know, you're an artist, you have to kind of do all these are children, do all the releases and things and communicate to the parent that the storyline would kind of go in a different direction. But in the photo, she did have headphones on and she was carrying these cones. And it was just them playing outside in the photo. But for this, it was really just, I was like, how do I communicate this cautionary tale? How do I kind of tell a story about a little girl that, you know, doesn't necessarily end so well? So. The headphones for me are really about her not knowing what's coming. Like she can't hear it. Like Breonna Taylor wouldn't have necessarily heard the police coming in, you know, if she if she was killed in her sleep or something like that. So and then the carrying of these cones, sort of like it's kind of like the weight we all carry. Like we carry this like this like sense of caution, this like sense of alert at all times. Every time we walk into a new room, every time, you know, every time we have to speak up at a meeting, this like sense of caution. And she's carrying that. This one does have the blue background, this kind of darker midnight blue kind of background because I did want to take place it contextually at night. Right. You know, because Brianna Taylor was still at night. Um, well, <clears throat> in the evening. And um and of course you see that she essentially has on pajamas, you know, it's just like a little polka dot pajama set, but the red polka dots in the pajamas um, signify like the, the shooting, the bullets. Mm. So she would have been hit by a bullet. So that's a lot of like the symbolism in this piece in particular. So she is of course the, uh, the cautionary tale. And, and and so often again, it it takes us being the executors of our own cautionary tales, right? Um, mm -hmm. You spoke again to um, how much um, national attention doesn't always go to our, you know, missing girls, um, to our mm -hmm. children being hurt or harmed, and and having such um, a haunting um, execution of an image where you're showing that imagery. I think, you know, thank you again for, for sharing and breaking that down for us, which is something that you get during an artist talk um, that you don't <laughs> right. get, unfortunately, you know, when, you, when you're coming and you're viewing a piece alone, but your work is so stirring and you're also still um, using beads uh, as a part mm -hmm. of the symbolism, I think, for, for young girlhood. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're, a lot of us are, are women of this age in our 40s. <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> um, who recall being young girls and so much of your summer existence was about getting your hair done and getting those beads um, and, you know, the, the the clank of, you know, like them hitting mm -hmm. next to each other and, and hearing um, and then seeing, you know, another little girl and kind of giving her the nodding look like, you know, like 
this was this was time um and this was also mm -hmm. care um but it was also a bit of freedom right um protective styles before we even talked about it um and, and then seeing um how you connect those beads to that um and, and, and also have us kind of come through them um and experience them can you talk about why you wanted to continue to use beads as a part um of your artwork uh, yeah, like it's really um, just formally in terms of being an artist and creating like a body of work that hopefully would last a lifetime. I do want to always sort of have narratives that run through the work in different capacities. So like the image that you see right now is my um, my friend and fellow artist, Christopher Clark. Um, he and his daughter, Kalila, came to visit the show. So you see Kalila like looking at one of the tables with the beads on the bottom. For me and my work, hair beads are like the quintessential, like specific intentional symbol for black girlhood. Like mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of black girls who did not have them or wear them at some point in time, you know, and just generationally, like it happened, it happens now, it happened for us. Um, and then you even have like this sort of revival of adults, you know, beating their hair. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that's another thing that just kind of carries through us generationally over our lifetime. So it is the single in my body of work. It is the single like definitive thing about black girlhood that you'll see in the work. And you talk a little bit about the tables. Um, and again, mm -hmm. um, shout out to your your fabricator, Michael Cottrell, um, for yes. helping uh, <laughs> to get these tables together for you. Um, they they look um, so juicy. Um, but I also love like not only the colors that you've been able to to kind of use and, and, and the elements of those, um, but just the positioning and kind of this opening, right? And so tables again, um, and, and seats and, and and how we kind of see ourselves present hold a lot of contextual value um in your work. So where do you really see these these tables and, and, and what kind of symbolism do they carry? It's just like one of those sort of things that comes up over and over again, you know, this this conversation about having a seat at the table. If, you know, anyone's on here who saw my show at Yellow House, uh, when it comes to installation, it's another sort of like narrative that runs through my work. This notion of just like this seat at the table, like what is this seat at the table thing? And we talk about it all the times in terms of like being given a seat at the table or having to take a seat at the table. And my approach to it is different. Like, I think we have our tables. I think we come here with our tables, whether that's through lineage, you know, whether our tables are gifted through us through lineage. But I think for a lot of us, we don't know that they exist. We don't know that we have them. So just in terms of where they are in the gallery, like each girl in this, in this body of work, in this ex exhibition has a table. So the color of the top of the table, you know, will match like the background. So what you see Kalila looking at is um, Little Dragon's table. Mm -hmm. And um, so essentially like the tables are here with them. It's just a matter of whether or not they know it, you know, and having to kind of find them in the space and know what's theirs. So it's really just sort of like this, this reckoning of that over life, like, you know, figuring out like, you know, I've always had the table with me. It's just a matter of me deciding what I want to do with it. So in terms of construction, um, I knew I wanted a table, but not like a table. And I also needed for in this show, I needed for it to be a child's table. But I wanted to sort of move it um, past just, you know, a literal table. And I wanted to have something that was kind of like an arc. Like if we're born with these tables, if we have them when we're young, like how do we move through life with them? So I really wanted to create kind of like an arc. You know, when you think of an arc, you think of like, you know, movement, like safety, like how do you move safely from one place to another? So I wanted to have two tables made. Um, some of the tables have an opening, like you can see in this one here. Um, and the opening represents two things for me. One is, one is an entrance or access. So it's like how the world, society, everybody has access to these individuals, you know, to these little girls. And then it's also an exit. So essentially, it's like, how do they grow out of adolescence? So it's an exit for them also. These tables will grow with them as um, as the show moves forward, as the exhibitions move forward. And of course, like they're, these are little girls' tables right now. So they, they have the hair beads on them. Um, they have the little hair barrettes on them. So it's just a signifier for adolescence. Um, can you show the blue one, Liz? 
Um, so all of the tables have the opening, mm. um, the entrance and the exit, um, all except for, of course, Tay's table. You know, just in telling you the story of Tay, hers is the cautionary tale. Hers is the one that doesn't end so well. So for her table, there is no entrance and there is no exit. Because um, ideally, as the story moves along, like there will be kind of a, you know, a day of, of reckoning, unfortunately, for her. And um, I, I think, again, there's there's also a, a sense of, of protection um, around mm -hmm. these tables and, and around these seats. And um, so striking, again, to see that the tables that allow a little bit of, of, of a, to get up, but also this now closed table that you have mm -hmm. and what that means for, and again, like not getting out. Um, I also heard, I think, a bit of your love still for um, the musical The Wiz and, and what these tables are, you know, and, and saying that we had the power. We had it all along and we could have just, you know, tapped our feet yes. to get out of it. But in and in, 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 in looking at Tay's That's, table. Yes. <laughs> So and and, and and knowing that even though we we had this, this this power, we still don't. There's still a lot of agency that is lost, um, and we still don't protect our black girls in the way that that we don't. So I, I feel that there's a lot of there's just a lot of power in, in looking at what that is and 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 where we need to go for it to continue that protection. Right? Like there's nothing we can do to take that piece out because it's. It's restrained, and I think you were pretty restrained, um, you know, still with 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 some of the wording that you could have given yeah. because yeah. there's there's so much that still is not being said, right? Um, in 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 young women and and how we speak to them. You also spoke a little bit about gender identities, um, and 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 how still we play a, a really big role in our community around that conversation, right? So. Um, mm -hmm. I want to speak more to one of the other characters that you have. I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the name of the image where the young lady is um, just has her hand out. Oh, that's Ra, R A, Ra. That Ra. Background one. Right. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about Ra. Um, well, just kind of starting that conversation, um, there will be, there's not in this show, but there will be. Um, eventually a painting, a character that does directly address this sort of gender identity conversation. Ra's story is a little bit different. Ra is my Afrofuturist. So mm -hmm. for those of you who are familiar with, you know, Sun Ra and this, you know, if you're like in the old school arts and culture community, like this idea of Afrofuturism way back in like the 60s and 70s, you know, you think about like a modern version, of course, is like Wakanda, Black Panther, you know, like how Black, black folks imagine a future for themselves, for their whole selves, not the selves that they've been told that they are, but for their whole self, whole authentic selves. So she's my Afrofuturist. She is, um, she has, she knows that she has the power to imagine and create a future for herself. Um, in dealing with like the whole notion of adultification and all these sort of like secret demise and things that, you know, little girls have to hold on to um, so often. She also, as a child, has the power to essentially escape. You know, she right. can go in her mind and escape. And the reason that she has to do that is like, this character is unfortunately a victim of like assault, sexual assault, verbal assault. So there are instances in her childhood where she has to mentally like escape. And that is the thing that will develop in her the the ability to create a new future for herself as she gets older. So she yeah, she's my she's my young Afrofuturist. She is also for me with this show, I had the opportunity to take some of my older students into the studio. Like um if you're if you have a child in my class, they're not just gonna learn, you know, how to paint pictures, but you know, we really talk about how to build bodies of work. So some of my students had um, a good bit to do with this painting and deciding what she looked like. You know, um, my students wanted the goggles. My students um, wanted the sort of like uh, like um, you utility jumpsuit that she has on with like the gadget belt and things like that. So they got to really kind of have um, some say so in this character. So that was that was pretty cool for me. I, I like the engagement. You said that a connection um, of of not only speaking about youth, but speaking to youth, right? Not just mm -hmm. creating these images in service of them, but working with them. Um, there's some, there's so many 
beautiful details that are on Raw. And I think what you spoke about um, is, is that essential transformation um, that unfortunately when something happens to these young girls, because there isn't still a lot of protection, like you said before, um, that communication is protecting family secrets, um, because so often that kind of abuse happens um, at the hands of someone who's in the family. So, and, 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 and turning into themselves and her turning into herself, how she's able to, you know, again, push back against that harm to create this new person. And so I love what your, your students did with talking about those utility goggles, right? Like she's going to need this on her journey, but I also, um, hopefully, you know, so many of the people who we have participating and also want to get ready to encourage you guys to keep putting in those questions. We'll start getting to you soon to, to include you as a part of this conversation. But um and 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 looking at it, I, I see this this variance um of your work. I didn't want to really preclude to some of your earlier work because hopefully people are familiar, but I I'm you're you're mastering, you know, these acrylic inks, you know, um, and <laughs> and where you're putting them, I think, um, in some of the richness that I'm seeing in the texture, um, and and what you're doing as far as representational of skin values, and how you're playing around with color, um, you really, again, I think, do use that that color will really heavily um, in the way that you influence. Um, and, and speaking and communication. So looking at this orange background, right? Seeing these um, definite blue kind of aqua, but these green barriers and also this kind of transition um, of, of what those color and images mean. Can you talk about your, your color choices and how you execute that um, with these portraits? Yeah, I would really like take the, the time, like answering that question for me is really talking about like being a student of art. Um, because in all honesty, when I am painting um, or when I'm choosing color, it is not really always about making formal choices. Like a lot of times I am, it's like call and response, you know, in the church, we have call and response. Somebody says something, you say something back. That's kind of how color works for me. I choose a color, I put it down, and then I choose the next color based off of what, what happens with the first color. So being able to work really kind of randomly when it comes to choosing color and it working formally, I think is just like a nod to having had formal training in an art classroom and understanding, you know, how one, like instinctually understanding how one color will play up against another color. So in some capacities, it is like just basic color theory. In some capacities, it is a very like specific, um, sort of like not to like what when a color means a certain thing you know like I had a very I had a, a conversation with my kids about this jumpsuit color you know like we knew we wanted her to look like a kid but um you know what color would this jumpsuit be to um serve the narrative I say that all the time in my class how does the work serve the narrative um so sometimes it is a matter of choosing colors to serve the narrative and sometimes it's really it was really random for me and so um, let's talk about this young lady that we have up on screen right now. This, this, this. Yes. Two. Yes. This, um, this character's name is O. Mm -hmm. And O is short for o Oya. Oya, who is um, an African deity. So, you know, for people who are familiar, like that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but if you are familiar with African deities, like I think Beyonce introduced a lot of people to Oshun in the yellow. Um, so you have like, it's just like you have saints in Catholicism, you have deities in African history. And Oya is, is the protectress. She is also like um, the one who sort of governs the line between the living and the dead. So for me, I wanted to have a character that isn't so much of a victim, you know, cause you know, you and I especially always talk about like how do we ride this line between trauma and joy, you know? Like how not to create trauma porn all the time, you know, when it comes to talking about the lives of black folk. So I did wanna make sure that in this storyline, there was this sort of like independent girl. And um, this is one of my students, of course, in, in real life, um, but the character she's playing in this, like her her characteristics, her representation is a foyer, so she is, she is the protectress, she is the guardian 
she doesn't need people to tell her what to do. She doesn't need um, people to make decisions for her. She's really like self-assured. And, you know, again, for those of you, I like to create a narrative that kind of runs across. You can see the rainbow on her shirt. Of course, when you think about a real rainbow, a real rainbow does not have brown in it. So the rainbow on her shirt is a reference back to or Color Girls, which was, um, you know, the root of the Yellow House show, her own things that I had a few years ago. And it just represents that rainbow from For Color Girls and these women of color that were each represented by one of the colors in the rainbow. And I really relate the, the old character to Intazaki Shange. You know, Lynn spoke a little bit in the beginning about, and I'll make this quick, I know we're kind of hit time. She spoke a little bit in the beginning about that book chapter that I wrote. I had the opportunity to write a book chapter Um, book that's coming out pretty soon about the Black Arts Movement and um, iconoclasm in the Black Arts Movement. And one of the most interesting things that I learned about Ntisaki Shange in that time was that she she was a student of the feminist movement. So she was in California, like in the years of like Woman House and Judy Chicago and things like that. She was also coming of age as an artist during the Black Arts Movement. And with both of those things kind of pulling at her, she still chose herself. Like there were problems with each for her and she still chose to kind of like make a path for herself. So O, o kind of represents that for me. Like she really is sort of like the independent one in all of this. Um, and, and even that, I think the communication, like you said before, of those kind of two images that people are familiar with them and, and how she also transforms. So her transforming into this young child again is, it's, it's still just that 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 reminder um, of celebration, like you said before, that fine line of walking between trauma and joy, which of course happens for us all as humans, but gets gets so centric into how you know black girls become black women. So um, we are getting very close to you know wrapping up this conversation with Aaron. It was. Um, such a joy to talk with you today and to hear directly uh, about this work and and how um, these conversations have really been affecting you um, and to see again what your creative process was to communicating more about this topic um, and how you want to work more I think with organizations where this is a, a centric line and how we can use this imagery for storytelling. Um, so we do have I think one question that I might have saw in the chat um, Lynn, forgive me if you might have a couple seen of them. something else. I yeah, see some comments. Like yeah, um, one I definitely want to uh, answer is um, Nikisha's question. Um, she is. You want to? You want to read one? I'll read, I'll read. So, um, okay. um, Nikisha is 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 on the line with us, and she's asking because mm -hmm. she knows that you watched Lovecraft Country, which forgive me, I have I have not, so I have no idea about what this means, but. Um, <laughs> You watch it during the pandemic, and she wants to know: Did the episode Jigga Jigga Bobo Bobo uh -huh. <laughs> Jigga Bobo have any impact mm -hmm. on you as you created this body of work aside from the literary aspect? So, for those of you who don't know, Nikisha, of course, Nikisha Elise Williams is this wonderful author. She has lots and lots of books that you all can go and buy. And in creating this show, one of the things I really wanted to focus on is learning how to tell better stories. Um, I, I even like took some classes from Nikisha in that time period and watching Lovecraft Country, which it took me a while to, to watch too. Lovecraft Country, Country is so rich in just storytelling and like unpacking and Easter eggs and all this stuff. But this particular episode, which I think if I'm right, Nikisha, this is the episode um, when Bobo had the funeral and then the daughter was left by herself. I'm, I'm thinking that's right. Just throw it in the comment if that's it. Um, she says yes. yes. So basically in this episode, there's a little girl, a Bobo in the, in the Lovecraft Country stories, it's Emmett Teal. And this little girl, a daughter in the story, I can't remember her name, Nikisha, is friends. Emmett Teal is her friend. He goes on this trip, of course, as Emmett Teal did, and he never comes back because we know the story of Emmett Teal. You know, we know what happened to Emmett Teal. So the story centers around the funeral and and she, this little girl, she's like preteen, is essentially while they while every all the other characters kind of have their own stuff to deal with, in this very like traumatic moment, she is left to fend for herself. You know, nobody is thinking about how this little girl is feeling, the things that she's dealing with. So yes, Nikisha, absolutely. This um 
not only watching Lovecraft Country, I would like tell anybody, not only go watch Lovecraft Country, but also go behind the episode and listen to the HBO podcast that really breaks down each episode. Like that's extremely important. So yes, it absolutely like really kind of worked its way into the work and this just whole idea of like, you know, adultification. Like we assume that little black girls are okay. We right. assume like send them out into the street. When you think about Taylor Williams, the little girl, her mom would leave her at home. She's like five. Her mom left her at home all the time. One, her mom left her at home all the time. Two, the neighbors knew it and nobody said a word because we assume that black girls are, are all right. We assume that they're, they can, they're old enough to take care of themselves. And it's just, that's, that's adultification. Like, no, like they need nurturing. They need care. They need love. They need somebody's attention. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for um, Jennifer for posting that. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer, for putting um, all the information into the chat. Please guys take a look at it. I will do my due diligence to try to get on the love craft country train before it, it exits the station again. But um, we also have another good question um, from Christopher Clark, uh, who wanted to ask, um, what do you want young black girls who view this exhibition to take away from the work? Um, for me, it is really about, for young black girls who, you know, I, I'm showing them essentially images, you know, they're not going to walk all the way deep into like all this symbolism and stuff like that. So for me, I am hoping, like those of you who know me, I talk about it all the time, like filling that void, like having a representation of yourself. It was really important for me to use my students, this AirPod keeps falling on, use my students in this work, for them to see themselves in this body of work, for them to see themselves in a fine art space. So for little girls who may not be able to kind of dive all the way into like these storylines and all this like, you know, all that stuff behind the image, I just want them to see themselves, you know, it's something that I didn't have, you know, or, you know, and I said, you know, we can't remember everything from my childhood, but if I saw it, I surely don't remember it. Like it surely wasn't impactful. So just, I really want, so yeah, you saw maybe earlier in some of the images, you saw Christopher's daughter in here. And I just want her to see something that she relates to. I try to use things in my artwork that are in a language that black girls and women understand. A lot of people might not understand. Like I, we were talking earlier about like, there is some language in this room, you know, like close your pocketbook, you know, like we know, but there was somebody else here who, who was like um, from a different culture, from a different background. And she didn't know what close your pocketbook mean, but you know, we know that means you need to close your legs. And it's something you hear a lot when you're a little girl. So just think like the hair beads, her seeing these little girls who look like her, I just wanted it to be familiar. So when it comes to little kids, I just want them to see themselves and take it from there. And that in itself, you know, is 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 powerful and 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 a bit provocative because like you just said before, if there were images that we could relate or see to, we don't recall them. And I think most of again, those were characterizations, even though you have made these characters as well. But I think character types are important when again it comes to storytelling to to push a narrative forward, which is that you know sometimes we need to make sure we're not moving too fast because of our own you know, not trauma, but experiences on placing on these young girls and to really, again, truly treat them as girls. So I know we're getting close to, to 430 and I want to be respectful and honoring everyone's time. Um, and again, just thanking, um, thanking FSCJ, you know, for, did I say, I hope I said it right, because sometimes I'll go back to the old. I thought, did I say the F? S, the C, the J? Yes. Okay, there we right. go. I um, just want to thank you guys again for, for having me uh, to be able to speak to Erin about her work. Can you tell us how long uh, the work will be up in the gallery, Erin? Yes, this is, um, it's a short run show. So this is only up through April the 9th. Um, this is a college campus. So I, I hope that you all can get out here. I hope that you can see it in person. The gallery is open Tuesday through Thursday from 10 to 4. So you really have to kind of plan your day, plan your day. Um, it is a COVID safe campus, so you'll need to wear a mask. You'll need to stay social distance. When you come to the door of the building, there's a phone number on the door because the doors are not just open all the time. There's a phone number on the door that you'll need to call to get access. So please, I hope that you all are willing to go through that to come see the show. But if you cannot, um, if you look in the chat, Liz, Liz, who's Liz? Lynn also, um, 
posted in the link. There's a 360 virtual tour that's available. So that link is in the chat. So you can actually view it virtually as well if you'd like to. I also wanted to say that we will be open um, Thursday oh, until yes. 7 p.m. For those of you that have nine to five jobs, you can um, you can come afterwards. That's a one, unfortunately it's the only night that we're open late, but at least we um, we have one night for you. Yes. <laughs> and someone's also asking about um, any any capacity issues. Uh, how many people can come into the gallery at one time? Uh, we prefer that if you come, uh, maybe like five people tops at a time, um, or just come in, you know, come in waves. Um, that we're just trying to keep um, capacity low um, while you're here. And I am also like, if I, I like some here, some first here, you know, I could talk about my work all day. So if you want me to come to you to talk about the work, I am happy to do that as well. So, so please take advantage of that. Again, mm -hmm. um, nothing to me um, helps you to to really inform and to see, you know, an artist's perspective about their work is to have them engaged in in an artist talk so that they can tell us um, and so that we again can engage and talk back and forth with them so we can not only understand their symbolism, but understand their story and, and their reason and purpose. So make sure that not only do we take care of our artists by supporting and coming to their exhibitions, but as you so beautifully have, I'm sure um, that your work there is also on sale. So make sure you support Erin as best you can um, by purchasing one of her works while we still have the ability and that we have her in this community, because as you can see, her work is, is going to be continuing to tell these necessary stories. So um, mm -hmm. I just want to thank again um, FSCJ for having us, and I will turn it back yes. over to Lynn yes. to end our discussion. And again, thank you to Missy for sharing about the book and so that you all can kind of engage in that discussion and learning some more. And to all the participants that were here today um, and to want to talk to Erin about her new exhibition, Pinkin', on uh, exhibition at the FSCJ South Gallery there until April 9th. Yes, thank you so much yeah. uh, to both of you. I really appreciate it. This is a wonderful talk. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you everyone. so much, everyone, and have a nice day.